Hello and welcome to White Centipede Noise Podcast. My name is Oscar Brummel, and today my guest is San Francisco-based noise artist and experimental instrument builder, Victoria Shen of Eviction. There were some technical difficulties with the recording platform I usually use, and we had to switch to another one about 10 minutes in. So please bear with us if the sound or image quality isn't as clean as it usually is. If you're a fan of White Centipede Noise Podcast, please support it at patreon.com slash white centipede noise. Victoria, welcome to White Centipede Noise Podcast. Thank you so much for meeting with, meeting with me this morning and uh, agreeing to talk about what you do. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's like uh, you know, Bill from, from Clipping um, was talking about his, his podcast with you and like speaking very highly of the experience, so I'm excited to be here. Cool. Yeah, Bill's awesome. Yeah, you just got off uh, a tour with Clipping, right? Or some shows. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, we did about four weeks together. I was I was overseas um, for two weeks before that, so it was like six weeks all together. So I'm still kind of worn out. <laughs> I yeah. just got back like uh, almost two weeks ago, but uh, yeah, it was amazing. It was so much fun. It was cool. like, unreal. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So before I start asking you like specific questions about what you do. Um, can you briefly introduce yourself and what you do as a sound artist or, you know, beyond that? Okay. Um, sure. So I'm Victoria Shen. I'm from San Francisco. Um, I describe myself as a sound artist, experimental music performer and instrument builder. Um, and so, I mean, there's like a, I guess I would say a bunch of rules that I, uh, go by when I perform or in my sound practice, like I, I usually, for live stuff, I only use stuff that I built or were gifts, so it's like a way to like jam in Kano. Um, but my my background is in like visual arts, and then through that, I met this woman Jessica Ryland, who taught me how to uh, build synthesizers, work with circuits and stuff like that. Um, from there, I started doing more like physical computing stuff, so like Arduino, like sensors, output devices, um, and so like I was doing a lot of the like, kinetic. Uh, sound sculptures and installations and then uh, my most recent kind of um, body of work was like uh, doing a, a series of speakers like var- variations of speakers um, like um, embroidered speakers uh, like we were using conductive thread on denim uh, like using um, copper coils uh, to transform different objects into speakers like uh, cassette tape into a speaker drum into a speaker I like also use that technique to make a, a levitating speaker, so like a speaker that's driven by kind of um, a magnetic force of a levitation platform. And then, yeah, with like this line of speakers, I had kind of culminated in this um, idea where, for my first uh, record release, I wanted to produce the album art using a copper coil, and I figured out that you can like modulate the voice coil, uh, like the width of it, so that it renders an image. Uh, as it like radiates outward, and so I like used that that, te- that technique to make like a self portrait on uh, the cover of my first record. So it turns the jacket of the the LP into a speaker through which you can listen to the record. Um, cool. And then and yeah, so that was like actually my first kind of uh, gateway into just the medium of vinyl and vinyl distribution. Uh, and then more recently, I um, like fabricated these acrylic nails with styluses in them uh, so I'm able to play up to like five um, 
grooves of a record at once. Like uh, if you put one on the thumb, you can play the underside of the record, which is spinning in the opposite direction of the top side, so it'll play in reverse. Um, yeah. And then... I'm going to ask you about all that stuff. I've got all that stuff on the on the radar. Oh, okay. Okay, well, I, I guess, yeah. Let's not get too deep into it. Anyway, that's kind of a, um, a short... Hold on, maybe short. The, <laughs> it's like an <laughs> intro into kind of the stuff that I'm doing. Hotel, Karas LP, a buried in slag and debris release, available from the label and distros in North America and Europe. That's interesting that you, that you uh, kind of were, I guess, introduced to Jessica Ryland. I, I mean, she's a she's a legend in the noise scene. I haven't, I mean, how long ago was that? I haven't seen her around much. I mean, I've never met her personally, but I've never, I haven't seen her. Her work or her name pop up in quite a while, but but I mean she's definitely a yeah, so a fixture. I met her maybe two thousand eight, I okay. think I'd say, and then I right. started working for her around then. Um, and then she moved out to the West Coast to go to Stanford uh, to get her PhD. Um, and then she was working for a while in like the engineering world, and then she keeps on talking about rebooting Flower Electronics, which was her company. But I oh, think cool. maybe the last time she played, it was for the for Buchla's memorial out here uh, when Don passed away. Because she had worked for, for him. And so in a way, I feel like I'm like the granddaughter of, of wow. like Buchla stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> cool. you know, she was like very involved with like a lot of people like um, Marianne Amache and like Paulina Oliveros and stuff like that. So I feel like, yeah, <laughs> maybe awesome. inheriting some of that through Jessica. Anyhow. Yeah. Definitely. Um, that's very, that's very, awesome. She has a family. Yeah, okay. so it's just her life is pivoted a little. Sure, a sure. Lot. Out now on Absurd Exposition, Zenta Sustained, Serpent Track Patterns 12-inch, new 2022 material from the cult collaborative project between Ryan Bloomer and Sam McKinley, forthcoming Absurd Exposition CDs from Dodge Jones Rage, Neural, Fold, and Rasalka, with many more releases planned for 2023 and beyond, plus over 2,000 items currently in stock at Scream and Ride Distro, Montreal-based source for experimental electronics, harsh noise, etc., offering affordable shipping worldwide. Visit ScreamingRide.com for ultimate noise power. So, you know, you 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 kind of gave a an intro into a lot of the the stuff you do live and your your various techniques. And I've never had the chance to see you play live, but I've seen you know insane videos of you doing these really intense physical performances. There was also a story which you may have caught Wyatt from SkinGraph kind of being shocked that. He didn't know anything about a noise show going on in his hometown, and it was you, and you were playing like a sold out show, and like a bunch of young people were there, and 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 like he was like, what? You know, like there's a whole new thing going on, and I don't know about it. So I get the sense that you play to very large crowds, larger than most noise artists do, and kind of crowds that are bigger and and maybe not so tapped into this like kind of predefined genre of noise. What do you? What kind of reactions do you get from the people you're playing to, and who are those people typically? So, um, I mean, that crowd was like all thanks to Machine Girl. The reason why it was like sold out was uh, because I was opening for Machine Girl, and like they have a very large, very engaged, very young audience. Okay, um, it's really funny because like um, they'll sell out like I mean, ginormous venues in my opinion, like six hundred cap or whatever this was at mahal's which i think is maybe like three or four hundred but the bar makes no money because they're all underage which is kind of hilarious but um yeah uh the uh yeah and that's just kind of been um 
that was the first time I was playing to crowds out that, that large, I would say. I mean, and the, the reactions were very, very positive. The reception was like shockingly positive. Even like Matt from Machine Girl was like, you know, when we asked you to play this, this tour with us, I was like, you know, half the people will get it and then half the people will like, I don't know, like walk out of the room. But it was like, I mean, full on receptive. So yeah. it was really great. Then like these kids were like moshing when I was like, um, you know, combing my hair with like, a, you know, this contact mic resin comb that I, you know, that I usually tour with. Yeah. So, yeah, it was it was totally shocking. And it definitely like it upped my my confidence a lot as a performer. Uh, I was very nervous. Like, I really anticipated, like, people throwing beer at me. Obviously, that wasn't an issue because nobody is old enough to drink beer. Sure. Uh, <laughs> and, like, um, yeah. Uh, and it's been, like, pretty good even when I opened for, like, Bonnie Prince Billy recently. We did, like, a very short tour together. So he had these relatively big crowds, too. We were playing with these really weird spaces, like a jazz club that had a kind of... Um, like retirement home cafeteria vibe where people were like sitting down and eating. And so like, I was like climbing on their tables and shit and like cracking whips and like, uh, it, it's, it was an uphill battle for most of their shows. It's like, at first there's like, you know, some like laughing, some giggling and like, people were like, Oh, what's like going on confusion. And then it's just like, um, fascination, I think. And I yeah. think, um, one of those reasons is because uh, my engagement with the instruments is very like diegetic. It's like every physical gesture has like a very audible result. Um, I think people can connect with that. I think the other, I mean, kind of reason where people might feel it's like compelling work is because uh, maybe like my identity, it's like as in like a small Asian female, like doing this sort of like confrontational, like very like gestural, uh, gestural uh, like movements i guess and like yeah. poses um and yeah it's just like a very unusual to see and i think that's one of the reasons why people can connect and uh yeah and clipping in europe it was likewise like pretty pretty positive and i think like um you know when a larger band chooses an opener like um they're trying to think of sort of like the energy level like over the night it's like oh like either a ramp up or whatever and it's like even though the genres are so disparate like um, whatever, like, you know, Machine Girl, which is much more dancier and like digital hardcore in that realm and like with like some jungle elements, stuff like that versus um, like clipping, which is like a rap, like a noise rap yeah. or, or um, I think I still like am able to hype people up, maybe like adding like an element of like fear into the mix also adds to this kind of like stimulation and like uh, arousal in non-sexual sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so reception has been like really great. I think people are like often confused, but they can understand like, oh, this is like a record. So I'm seeing it happen and I get like how it works, but I've never seen it in this context before. So I like, I'm thinking of like the instruments as like ready-mades. You're like uh, encountering a familiar object, but you are, um, so you're like re-navigating, renegotiating your relationship to it because you've never seen it function in this, this context. Yeah. So something like yeah. What do you think happens to some of those people when they, after they see you, like, where, what do they go home thinking? You know, I mean, that's probably their first introduction to noise music, which for the people that are, you know, into it or like heavily entrenched in it, and there's nothing shocking about it anymore, but there's like something about that first experience. I mean, I can remember my first noise show and like, it's like, what the fuck? Like, do you think that, what, what kind of experience do you think that is for those people? Do you think that had any lasting effect on them? Let's hope so. I think so. Um, people have written me like, you know, months later talking about how they still think about it, which is, I mean, to me, it's so flattering. And like, I mean, I would have never imagined like my performance practice, like having kind of um, that making that kind of impression. But um, yeah, I mean, I remember my first noise. I mean, I listened to like noise rock and stuff a lot in like in high school and, and college. But like going to my first like noise noise show, I was like a bit repulsed, you know, to be to be honest. And I think a lot of people can have that reaction to my work too. But like it still sat with me, and then you like acquire a taste for it, and then it's like an obsession or a love for it. Um, and uh, hopefully, <laughs> uh, the uh, the whole um, what is it? The, the whole narrative of like my single set, somebody can just go through that just all at once, and then I don't really have to sit with it for too long. Yeah, uh, that's, that's my hope. But um, yeah, maybe that's too much to hope for. But I, I think, yeah, it. people also, a lot of them are like inspired to do stuff too. I mean, a lot of like women have written to me and are saying like, oh, 
they're inspired to be like a little bit more like performative with their work, like uh, like physically expressive and stuff like that, or like they want to learn how to do circuits, which is fucking awesome. That's yeah. great. And, and just people in general, like if anybody wants to like learn how to do stuff has a curiosity i think that's like the goal of art is to kind of like instill and perpetuate a sense of curiosity through uh the course of life um so like let's hope that's the case cool uh, when you're on stage or on the floor or the tables or whatever um what's what's going through your your head or your 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 inner self because i mean you're very yeah like you said you're confrontational you're from the videos I've seen, you kind of really own that presence. I mean, in a really intense way, what, what do you tap into when you're performing? Uh, let's see, you know, <laughs> like this kind of a uh, performative, uh, whatever, uh, this, like the confrontation, like the physicality of the performance, like came out intuitively. And I was like, I don't know why it's just, um, as kind of almost like a form of dancing. It's just a reaction to the sound and stuff like this. But I think there's like probably some darker origins <laughs> for that. I mean, like I have really messed up health and my mom is like so like screw she's a refugee from Cambodia and she's like just like experienced like every kind of abuse you can imagine. It's really fucked up. And like it's kind of a miracle that she's like able to function at all. So I think some of that is bleeding into performance it's like your ability to like uh like, tap into like the depths of of like emotion whether it's like you know joy because a lot of it is joyful but also you know like things that are kind of darker more like despairing but so I think uh, very frankly I think that is a part of it but really it's just it, none of that is going through my head when I'm performing it's just like a pure reaction to the music at the same time it's it's a a, a you know you're being present, not just with the sound, but also with like the space too, like with the audience and then also like the site itself. And that's something that I always try to uh, think about is like how to like engage with the space that kind of like draws attention to like the fact that we're here now. And then I think um, kind of pushing the envelope and um, kind of like touching the edges of like what's possible before your gear breaks or you break yourself or something like that is uh, one one way of, of doing that. Um, so that's that's usually what's going through my head, like improvisationally. Like I will say, like when I get to a place, like I'm kind of like scoping out, like oh, what are some like architectural uh, mm -hmm. specificities? Oh, that's a, a, the other thing. Like site specificity is like this kind of like art term that I think is like really hackneyed and bromide by now. But I do think like the 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 thrust of it is very uh, interesting still and like very like stimulating to engage with. So. Yeah, I try to like tailor my performances to the site. Um, but yeah, when I just perform, <laughs> it's like, who knows? <laughs> because like, it, it's like audience chemistry too, you know? Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, that's usually what's kind of like going through my, my head. And it's like, also you're like, I have like a lot of props. I was telling people that I, sometimes I feel like the carrot top of noise or something. I'm like, oh, like this prop and that prop and this prop. But um, yeah. Uh, the order gets mixed up all the time. All of that isn't kind of pre-sequenced. Like I just kind of think like in the moment, like what would be like a really good next sound to have to like make it very dynamic. Uh, so that's also going through my head while I perform. Was, did that, I mean, you kind of said you kind of just, it comes intuitively, but did that, did that come naturally to you? Did you have to kind of get over a certain hump to, to have that sort of confidence and that kind of full on engagement? Or did that, is that something you have experience with before or that kind of comes naturally to you um i've always been very outgoing like my mom tells me stories about like when i was a kid i would just like pull up chairs to strangers tables at restaurants and like just chat with them um so maybe like naturally i'm like this but um like outgoing but uh in terms of performance it was definitely like it took some time to like come out of the shell i was like in a band before that was sort of like a pseudo lightning bolt, like a uh, mind flayer thing. And there was like some like audience interaction uh, there, but mm, yeah, I, th I think it came with time, but it feels like the most natural way to, to play now to this point where it's almost like, uh, if I like really stuck on a stage or stuck behind a table and just like, doesn't, I feel like I'm in a straight jacket a little. So yeah. Available now on virtues, Kate Rissick, decayed signals LP. Kate Rissek has been cultivating her sound with strict focus, making her project Rusalka a veritable household name. 
For her new LP on Virtues entitled Decayed Signals, she sheds the Rasalka moniker, starting fresh, yet sacrificing none of the project's intensity and strength. Also available, John Miller. The future is unlimited, always. Digibook CD. Mott. Fickle CD. Releases from Corporate Park, Doll, Swollen Organs, Fog of Joy, Climax Denial, and more. This and other quality post-industrial music can be discovered at virtueslabel.com. You've described some of your 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 instruments and methods, um, which are really, you know, prevalent and 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 a big visual and and conceptual. I feel a thing of what you do. Um, can you talk a little bit more about them? And is someone, for example, from the Discord server, I asked them. Okay, so I'm interviewing Victoria Shen. Someone just asked if you could explain or talk about a little bit the concepts behind the objects that you use. You've talked about the fingernails that are that are mic'd with pickups and the comb um do those have symbolic meaning or conceptual meaning or are they just you know how do you what's behind some of those different objects and maybe go into some more of them that i don't maybe know about sure um okay so um i can talk about like the overall philosophy there's like i mean uh this, this whole framing that i use um coming from sort of my visual arts background talking about like abstract expressionists and how uh, like the modernist movement in the Americas was all about like anti-propaganda, anti-kitsch, uh, like anti-representation. So it's like, I feel like noise is like the sonic version of that visual technique. But visually, that's a very like defanged, old school, like sort of cliched approach. But I think in sound, there's still like a very radical potential there uh, to be like apolitically political, if that makes any sense. Um, so it's not, um, it's not a sound that's like meant, or it's not like an experience that's meant to transport you in any place or time or genre, harmony, whatever. Uh, so you're kind of displaced and it's sort of uncomfortable. And initially modern art was seen as, uh, an uncomfortable experience, uh, to be in the presence of. So, uh, I think noise definitely still has that aspect. And then, you know, the, the OG writer of like the modernist theory was like, Clement Greenberg, he's talking about how um, when you would encounter like modern abstract art, there's this critical gap between you as the, the subject and the art, the object. And like, there's that gap in which like somebody can have like a true aesthetic experience, you know, or in, have like an interpretive aesthetic experience. And I think people can do that too. It's almost like a Rorschach test or something. And someone's confronted with noise or something where there's like no, um, what is it? Like a kind of recognizable si signal. So anyway, that's just kind of the basic philosophy of, of like my approach to what noise is. But that at the same time, my critique of modernism is that, you know, art only exists because of the frame that uh, gives it value. And so context is very important. So I kind of alluded to this earlier, but like, you know, my identity as like a, like an Asian female also colors the way that, you know, the sound is coming out, like myself identifying as the author of the sound. Uh, and then like where we are in this space and like who we're surrounded by. So those specificities also impinge on the meaning. So um, like that, that being said, uh, like my kind of body, like, you know, doing these performative things is like a sort of like political thing, I think, you know, not, not super overtly, but, you know, uh, the subtext is, is that. And so I think uh, it's a kind of very similar uh, thread that's running through the instruments that I use. Uh, and this just, of course, sprang out intuitively. I did do nails at some point. So, I mean, it was just kind of natural that I feel like. To, like like as a job? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was okay. a nail technician, like, out of college to, like, mm -hmm. try and, uh, <laughs> like, muster up some money. I had, like, a, like, a lot of debt. Um, mm -hmm. And luckily, I ended up with a nice job. Anyway, for just for a little bit. And then I quit that uh, during the pandemic. Uh -huh. Anyway. Um, so, do, 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 do. oh, yeah. So just like with the nails and the, and the hair, like the comb references the hair, um, these are like very biological sort of like abject things. And it's really, I mean, there's a lot of ways you can look at it. it in, in some ways, it's like a form of extended technique because you're extending sort of the functionality of like the human body, right? Or you're extending like the functionality of like the instrument. Um, and then in the other way to look at it is like they're ready-made. Like it's, these are familiar objects uh, that have a completely different relationship to reality and a different function, um, you know, than you're used to. And so it kind of like takes you a second and it, it sort of makes you, uh, there's like that critical gap there when you have to be like, oh shit, okay, this is something else. Um, and so those are sort of the 
surface aspects of it. But I think, you know, another aspect of modernism that's really drawn to is the medium specificity. So like, what is like a record or like, what is like a circuit? And so uh, I think my really like granular approach of like making stuff myself, like doing circuits myself, uh, gives me a way of like being more playful and flexible with it, uh, like pushing it, the medium to its, its kind of like limit or logical conclusion. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So I think that's also the same place from which like the, um, speaker covers came out of. Um, and, uh, yeah. And just, uh, uh, exploration of different objects, like, like a bandsaw blade or like, you know, you take like a, uh, like a, a, a snare drum wire and like you you also use that another form of like extension is like I put that in my mouth I don't know why I just like like to use my mouth as like the fifth appendage or something like that and then just like use that to, to hold instruments um so and then what are some of the other instruments I mean I, I have like since like I built a, a Lira 8 from just a PCB use that a lot um the Jealous Heart which is a flower electronics uh noise synth that I use a lot too uh, and then other objects. Yeah, I used to use a lot of drums, mic drums. Anyway, sorry. okay. I saw, I saw, I saw in uh, the description of one of your recordings. It was like I, I can't remember right now, but it said something like made with like synthesizer or something else, and like Bojingo or or Bozillo or something like a what band is a ban, banjo Zillo or something like that uh, something. Like... Oh, a Benjolin. Benjolin, yeah, yeah. What is that? Oh, yeah. Oh my God, the Benjolin is incredible. Okay, that's that's another. Fuck, dude. There's so much shit to talk about. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> like, okay, so the, the impetus for a lot of Jessica's circuits, her designs, was uh, kind of um, enacting like chaotic formulas or like uh, chaotic circuits. So uh, a chaotic system is like a system that's very sensitive to initial parameters meaning it's very difficult to control and ever get like the exact same results. So like even having the same parameters will have um, kind of a periodic, very complex uh, sound behavior over time. So, um, and that's just also another aspect uh, that resonates with uh, modernism, which is all about like the de-skilling de of the artist and like the doing away of mastery. Mm -hmm. So like, a, you know, like KG and aleatoric sort of approach um, but uh, to, 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 yeah, so the Benjolin is uh, this, this circuit. It's a synthesizer designed by Robert Hordyke, who's um, a Dutch uh, circuit designer who passed away recently, which is very sad because he was an incredibly like, generous, uh, inventive, thoughtful person. But uh, he invented this, this synth that has, I think, two oscillators and two um, filters that he calls wranglers. They use, like, um, uh, they do have some like two digital chips in them to, to do like the, the rungling, but um, the, the end result is very chaotic behavior. Mm -hmm. Like things like bifurcate and like reconverge and stuff like that uh, sound wise. And uh, I really was like attracted to that instrument. And so that was actually kind of the first PCB that I made like from scratch, like not going to a board house, but um, like just milling into like a copper plate. Um, and then more recently, like I did one with a clear PCB, just like using um, vinyl cut copper and then like applying that copper onto like a laser cut acrylic and then just like soldering onto that copper. Anyway, um, yeah, I mean that, that with that method, you can do stuff like um, you can apply the copper foil on like flexible like acetate. So like I was making like chokers and like masks mm -hmm. and stuff like wearables. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's what the Benjolin is fucking great noisy little sin cool yeah a lot of, a lot of sounds mm -hmm. um what about the 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 records you use you know you, that's a big recurring instrument and i'm curious about how do you make them how do you have access to this technology where did that connection come from so the records that i used initially there were just like records that i found on the street in san francisco because there's always there's like so much trash on the streets all the time because like so many people are just being displaced constantly yeah uh, and so that didn't have any sort of like uh, intentional curation, you know, aside from like, you know, site specificity is from the, the streets of San Francisco. Um, and the technology is very, very simple, like ancient technology, which is right. just molding and testing. So uh, I think where the idea came from was I was doing molding and casting of uh, my first like 
album, which is on, on cassette. So I was uh, making pewter cassette tapes. So they're really nice and heavy. Um, they're very aesthetically pleasing, in my opinion. And so I have this like experience with like this, uh, this medium. I just have this tendency to just kind of like mix and match different kind of like approaches and methods of like of like art making. So um, yeah, I was like, fuck. I wonder if a mold could capture the resolution of a groove, you know. And then is uh, resin viscous enough to capture that resolution too? Uh, and the Short answer is yeah. So like, cool. if you want the really long answer, like uh, I was doing stuff with microphonographs. I don't know if you're familiar with this technology, but it was like the first kind of uh, voicemail. It's like um, in, I think like the 1910s. No, no, maybe even the 1800s. They were, um, they were cutting little um, acetate and then like gluing them onto postcards. And so you could like send a postcard with like a little message on it to your, to someone across the country, and then they were were able to play your voice message. Wow! Um, so uh, in the sixties or seventies, Audible, the Audubon Society released this um, series called the Audible Audubon, which is just like kind of Pokemon cards with different birds uh, from the U.S. and then bird calls, and then like a, a narrator describing like the bird's behavior or something like that. And so you can find them on eBay. So I was, I was using them. I was like cutting them up and like uh, hacking the, the player. It's an interesting technology because the, the acetate itself stays stationary. And then there's a needle that moves that spins around uh, from the inside out. So I was hacking those, um, those players to like go in reverse and change speed and stuff like that. And I was like, ha, huh, I wonder if I could mold and cast those little microphonographs. And uh, successfully, I was able to do that. And I was like working with Aaron Dillaway. We're thinking of like doing, I mean, I guess, I don't know if it's like a secret, but whatever. <laughs> like thinking of doing like a release this way, uh, like making a lathe where you can cut microphonographs and people can still acquire the players um, mm -hmm. and like play the microphonographs. And we'll just do like a series of like singles or some shit, like on <laughs> each little acetate. Anyway, um, yes, yeah, so that's the first thing. And I was like, oh, okay, if well, that works, then maybe a record can work. And I have to uh, just say autobiographically at this point in time, I had moved back from Boston to San Francisco. I was in Boston for 13 years uh, and I was sleeping on someone's couch for seven months until I got, um, uh, I landed a place. I, I won the, the housing lottery and I was able to uh, afford a below market rate uh, apartment in San Francisco. Oh. It was very hard to find uh, affordable housing in San Francisco. Any, anyhow, so <laughs> that's when when I finally got like a workbench, then I was able to like, that's when I like busted out the, the needle nails because I had this idea for a while. Then I was able to experiment with like molding and casting because I finally had like the space to be messy because it's a very messy process. Um, and so, yeah, all these ideas were kind of backed up for a while and I was finally able to like execute them. So that, that's what happened. Yeah. Um, and did you want more in, on the process of how it works? I mean, I, I think that's pretty, I think you've been pretty, pretty thorough. That's, uh, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, that's super fascinating. Do you, do you build all that stuff in the studio you're sitting in right now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And what, I mean, yeah. Like what kind of, investment or what kind of what, what kind of work goes in that like what kind of equipment do you need for that because that seems like a very abstract and specialized not only labor intensive but like m m equipment intensive process uh okay let's see it's not that bad the molding and casting is really not so bad it's very simple in fact uh i get a little fancy in a way where i um i like laser cut cages to like hold the molds so that's just laser cut acrylic. And then this is this thing I'm working on for Matmos right now, which is um, I'm like pouring a fraction of a record um, into the molds. And then once that's cured, I take it out and then I shift it over by like, I don't know, like 25 degrees or something like that. And then I pour again in the same place. So um, I'll get like repeating grooves that way. Right. And like I initially what I what I tried was like I was cutting up records into like just fractions and then doing a mold just on that fraction, pouring um, resin in that and then like repeating it. So it's like I have a sixth of a record and I repeat it six times. And like my aim was to try and approximate like footwork music, but like 
I think uh, it, it ended up sounding a lot more like happy hardcore. I think if I want to actually do footwork music, I should kind of like stagger the like the fraction size of the record to get that sort of like uneven like uh, offset weight quality to it. Um, but uh, yeah, and you know, I didn't even talk about like the initial things that I was doing. So yeah, I was like, oh, can I bootleg records? Yeah, okay, it sounds pretty good when you just do a direct impression, but you can't just leave it at that. So it's okay, let me try doing like the Christian Markley thing where I cut a record in half, put it together and then uh, cast it as a whole as like a unified object. And so like the first thing I did was Shade and Morris Day in the Time. And it was very musical, like way more musical than I like anything else I've ever done. So uh, and it had this like four four quality to yeah. it. And of course, it's like, well, I want to do something like with my own work with friends. So I did something with Dillaway where I took um, the, the oh, my God, what is the gag file? And yep. my half and half it. And then I also, the nice thing about using resin is you can embed shit in it because it's just, it's liquid for a while. So I embedded a zipper in the middle of it to kind of, uh, it's a couple of things it's like to sort of um, uh, like, allude to like the the splicing quality of like the the the, the record and then also um it's like a sticky fingers kind of reference which that was like my point that's anyway, cool uh, we, just, we just did an edition of 33 of those and like they sold pretty quickly and then this stuff is actually i can imagine nice. i mean those are those looked amazing i mean that was that's a, that's so cool i mean that's uh I mean, how do how do they play out do they do they all play out differently i mean no, they all play the same. That's like the kind of insane thing. It's like, they're pretty, you know, I mean, like um, it's not perfect because I'm not using a vacuum chamber. And so there are some bubbles in mm -hmm. the resin. So the mold itself, the negative is pretty lossless. Like it's, it's in the grooves really good, but uh, it's just the little bubbles in the resin that like introduce some noise. So there are slight variations uh, in quality across each individual one, but everyone kind of has the same tracks on it. Um, and I gotta say, like, we did recording it. We should release the recording, but it sounds fucking great. Really, really good. good. And I did one where um, I, like, demolded it when it was, like, still floppy. And so it has this, like, ooh, the quality to it. It's super nice. Um, anyway, yeah. So we should, we should, I should talk to Aaron about that. Yes, I put, I, you know, the same technology with the, um, this, the coil on the, the record cover. Mm -hmm. I did that inside a, a record while it was still curing. So there was a, a voice coil embedded in the record. So it turned the entire record into a speaker. So then I was able to have the record play itself. And there were some complexities there because like anytime you're dealing with spinning stuff and electronics, you have to worry about the, the wires tangling up. So the solution to that was, um, using a battery and a, a radio receiver and transmitter pair uh, and an amplifier. And then you can get the um, record to play itself. And it, it has like some really cool, like feedback uh, qualities to it, depending on like where the needle is, like on the speaker, um, like how loud it is and stuff like that. So I think I wanna do some installations using that, which is kind of like a room full, full of like self-playing records or something. Like so I'm like all into this. Yeah. Uh, kind of uh was it a, <laughs> a human oroboros or whatever shit where it's like the, the thing is very like kind of tautological or like you know uh, have you have you ever considered like as a maybe a project or in the future doing some sort of mass production of some of these very very handmade projects that you do like i mean you know having something fabricated in a way that could then be produced in a factory, like, but but according to your kind of very specific specifications. Uh, sure. I mean, look, the thing. I mean, not the records. I, mean, I don't think that's maybe maybe the records. But um, the thing I'm thinking about is um, I recently make noise like sent me some gear, and um, I never fucked with your rack ever before. I just have like a, 
aversion to it just because I, I came up from like the Jessica Ryland school where it's like all analog and like kind of all standalone modulars and stuff mm-hmm. or, like not to any kind of specification or a protocol. So um, I had this like big skiff, I like to call them spliffs, but like uh, with like a, what is that thing called? The, um, the mem- morphogene, the morphogene in there, it's kind of like this like full like sampler microsound module. Uh, and then this like big empty space. And I was like, oh, it would be like kind of amazing and sort of an affront to the philosophy of your rack if I just put this big dumb turntable on it. So um, I like designed and built a turntable for that your rack unit. Uh, and it's just like, just because it's like so big and so simple, it's like really flies in the face of like, kind of like your rack fetishism, mm-hmm. I think. Um, but if somebody wanted to kind of like license that and just like do that, uh, and like sell that and like i would just take us a, a percentage of it i'd be so down i yeah. i'm dying for passive income on that <laughs> <laughs> hustling is really tough i mean it's kind of amazing because um i i do teach but like other other than that i just feel like uh yeah i'm never gonna work full-time again so yeah, yeah. What, what, you you teach what do you teach or do you still teach right now yeah, I teach. Um, so init- the first time I was teaching, I was teaching digital fabrication at Harvard, which is, uh, you know, like laser cutting, uh, 3D printing, like physical computing, like sensors, electronics, and some like internet of, of things uh, stuff. And then right now I'm like working at Stanford and at SBA, and I'm teaching sound art uh, at SBA, which is like this course that I built from scratch and I'm, like pretty, pretty proud of it. It was a lot of work. Um, and then at Stanford, I'm like helping, uh, people do physical computing stuff mostly. Mm-hmm. And like, I also like help run the lab at the computer music school. It's CCRMA Karma. It's like the center for uh, computer research and acoustics and music or music and acoustics. Sorry. And, um, yeah, I like go down to Stanford like once or twice a week, which is kind of a, a hike. It's a, I like bike to the train station, take an hour train ride and then bike to the campus. So it takes up a lot of time. Um, yeah. And then I do SBA at the School of Visual Arts in New York remotely. Okay. Um, do you think that noise, you know, I know you're what what you're doing is maybe beyond the the genre scope of noise, but it's still very much noise in my in my mind. And do you think noise has potential to be a pop? form of art a pop genre uh commercially viable etc cetera, etc cetera. oh yeah for sure i think um in my mind i think fucking uh royal trucks and wolf eyes got very close to like very mainstream kind of popularity um but i think it already sort of is but in the genre of hip-hop because like i think hip-hop uses a lot of um like avant-garde noise techniques with like the sample and the cut up type of aesthetic. Uh, and I mean, realistically, I think that's probably like the avenue of least resistance for uh, introducing a mainstream audience to kind of like noise concepts and aesthetics. And um, I think with like horror rap and horror core, like clipping, you know, clipping, I would say has mainstream success. I mean, they're on sub pop, right? right. Uh, and there's def- there's so many elements of noise in it um, in terms of, like full on harsh noise being popular. Sure, why not? I mean, Mertzbo was just kind of blasted in like the Shibuya intersection, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm sure, I think it'll be like in very small bursts. You know, I don't, I don't yeah, I don't know. I, I think there's a possibility. <laughs> but like what you're doing is very much harsh noise in, in my mind. I mean, sonically it is. I mean, it's, I've never seen you perform, like I said, but it, there's no, from what I've gathered, like, rhythmic 4-4 four, four kind of thing being pushed through it's very free noise and you're playing to very large audiences of very new people and it seems like you get like great great feedback i mean I, do you think it's maybe a question of how it's packaged to people how it's presented to people that could kind of break their kind of it's kind of i mean the word noise is kind of like a tab i think sometimes i think the word noise kind of sets up a a taboo beforehand where people aren't really then as willing to listen to it or experience it um with open mic they're like okay this is noise it's supposed to sound 
ugly and bad. I'm supposed to hate it. Like, you know, right. but where right. I think is the concepts, the, 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 the visuals, the experience could be much more, could really be quite accessible. Mm. Yeah, I know. I think you're, you're a hundred percent right. And that's actually a problem that I have with academia too, because it's like in the end, the fine arts world, if you attach the label of noise to your practice, you're instantly dismissed. Like you're not exactly. getting funding. You're not getting a platform. Um, and yeah, the same is probably true of like this kind of consumer music. Um, I think like, you know, was it, uh, who did Mo- Motomami? Was that Rosalia? Is that? I'm not sure what that is. I would, so that's like, um, this, uh, Spanish woman, uh, young, very young woman who's like making kind of like dance music, but also is like listening to Mertzbo and stuff like this, um, having like very, uh, uh, positive reception to the noisy aspects of her performance. And I think, yeah, the packaging definitely matters. And I think it's more palatable coming from maybe like a woman than like mm-hmm. a shirtless mm-hmm. white guy or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I think like these have changed a little bit. Uh, so not to knock on shirtless white guys. I mean, come on. <laughs> but so it takes all kinds. I like to look at some man meat sometimes, but um, <laughs> Yeah, I think the packaging is like super important. And I mean, as music execs have known this for ages, right? And so, I mean, and I'm thinking of, you know, Walter Benjamin when he talks about uh, like art in the age of mechanical reproduction, he's sort of saying, well, you know, photography and film throws a, a wrench in these sort of classical models of like art consumption, right? But uh, even so, even if the audience is absent minded, there's still the potential for like the aesthetic value, the aura of the art to like reach them. And so I think that's the same with noise. It's like kind of the nice aspects of noise, like the critical kind of darker aspects or, you know, whatever functional aspects, culturally important aspects of noise could still have an impact, even if the audience is just into it because of the packaging, which is, I mean, depending on your perspective, that's to be bleak, but I think it's, it's fine. I mean, sure. You know. Yeah. I mean, it's the packaging is the packaging, even if it's not trying to be the packaging. I mean, the packaging exists in a big way in the noise underground. It's just different, you know. Just, That's true. Oh, it's like your how special is your tape packaging, right? That's right. another kind of fetishism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you do. I mean, you do have a lot of connections, or at least some quite a bit of press and publication through quite mainstream avenues. I mean, you were interviewed by Grammy. Oh, basically, I don't know the Grammy Foundation or what. And so that's very, very unusual for anyone involved in noise. I mean, even like Grammy to interview some more outsider musicians is is quite unusual. But the, but how, how have you kind of had this avenue, or how what what was your into these kind of these kind of publications, and what's that been like interacting with them? Okay. Oh my goodness. So I th- that's just like total happenstance. I think it's just kind of uh, the, what is it? The kindness of strangers type of thing. Like uh, I got that interview through Jordan Reyes who runs uh, American Dreams Records. Yep. So he did my release with the, the record. I think like um, the packaging was very uh, critical for that interview because it's unusual that, oh, there's like a speaker. And so I think that got the attention of, this writer who has like very uh, outre interests, you know, out there kind of um, uh, interest in the underground, I guess, because he also interviewed Ono for the Grammys. Too. So uh, it's just by pure happenstance that that, that worked out. Um, and then just like the other, like the nail, the needle nails, it's very uh, immediately understandable and it's like poppy and campy and stuff like that. And so I think, um, that got shared a lot when I, that first was posted online. And so then that got, got some attention too. And then like this Beyonce thing that happened earlier this year. Uh, yeah, so what happened there? Oh, okay. So <laughs> like British Vogue did this a promo shoot for Beyonce's new record. And uh, the creative director and like stylist somehow like saw my, my work and then like just, you know, just nabbed it. And I probably very innocently, it's like, oh, this is like an internet thing. Like, we'll just use it, right? Uh, and when I saw it, I was like, whoa. Uh, first, I was like, really? Uh, like, oh, man, uh, I guess that's it. Like, I, I can't really say anything. But then I was like, okay, well, why don't I just 
like allude to the fact that this is like a very blatant rip. I was like, well, thanks for like promoting this idea. It's really cool. Um, like some credit would be nice if possible. Um, and I think because it was such a non-confrontational like way of pointing it out, uh, the creative director like reached out to me and was like, hey, listen, I'm really sorry this happened. Like we really respect your work. Uh, like maybe we can collab in the future. That's not it's just, you know, like a conciliatory comment. Um, but our PR person is going to be in touch with you. And then British Vogue is like working to, to change the credits too. And I think actually that also happened because there's a lot, a lot of people like posting on the the, Vogue, the British Vogue posts, like calling them out for it too, yeah. which is really nice, like very touching, honestly. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. And so then the PR person got in touch and then was like, oh yeah, we're sorry this happened. British Vogue will change it on their end. So then they, they, they just tagged me at the end of the post, like, you know, a day later, which is like more than I could have fucking expected. A lot sure. of people were like, oh, I give Victoria her bag, you know? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the reality is like nobody gets paid like in that industry. It's all kind of like exploitation and exposure kind of. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I mean, that being said, uh, a couple months later, uh, the PR person reached out and like bought uh, a set for me. So and then they used <laughs> then they used the set um, that I sent them for a fucking ad on like a Beyonce's like uh, like album selling account on Instagram. And like my name was like tagged next to like Walmart and Target and Barnes and Nobles. Like, Jesus. <laughs> this is a kind of weird feeling. It's not. That's <laughs> it's crazy. It's, it's, almost, it's, almost, it's almost surprising that they even admitted to it because they probably didn't have to. Like yeah. they probably have enough. They're probably lawyered up enough where they could have just been like, block we don't know you whatever yeah because then what but then once they admit it i mean it's they just make themselves look i don't know not worse because i mean like they're doing the right thing but it's like oh yeah yeah you're right we did steal from you here's a little tag like but you know nothing else like you know it's just it's crazy though it's 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 uh yeah that's really that's really wild because i mean that that is the admission that they did i mean they could have just said we have we we thought of that that's that was our idea you know we didn't know yeah. we never we never seen you you know but there's so plausible deniability like they could be like what the fuck are you talking about yeah, for sure yeah no, and they actually the yeah, beyonce fans on twitter i mean i talked about this in like other outlets but like they were so ruthless i was getting like death threats and shit on twitter and that was like the most anxious i've ever felt and i'm not a like an anxious person like at oh. all and like, I didn't like feel anxious, like on the surface, but at the same time, I was like, wow, I'm like not eating. I'm like not sleeping. Like what's going on Crazy <laughs> for, for, like, a day, for like a day. But then, it, you know, it's like, it's ADD culture and it's just like on to the next thing. Right. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was weird. Cause on Instagram, people were very, very supportive. And then on Twitter, it was like a fucking, yeah, total hate fest. <laughs> I think that's how it works. Uh, yeah. Anyway, it's an interesting experience. I'm like, not, not to say that I'm glad I went through it. But it was uh, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> it was a really weird time. It's very interesting. It's a very weird time. Um, I mean, I kind of think the whole like, oh, you should be glad for exposure, kind of like thing that's being pushed everywhere in the world is kind of bullshit. But do you think there are any any like benefits or or positive aspects of kind of experimental noise underground culture being appropriated by you know mainstream outlets, corporate? America, could there be any positives of that? Yeah, I think you know, so besides so. getting money, but like, <laughs> like them, them paying you. But I mean, like, because I, I, I also saw, or someone, someone mentioned recently that you know, like one of the Mother Savage m- compilations, like Noise War, like the classic compilation was like the cover was just printed on a t shirt by some fashion house and the back just said like Mother Savage. And it's just like no, no credit, no nothing. But it's like now this like cool $70 shirt exists that, is like worn by someone for you know i don't know do you think there could be any oh man that's positive aspects of that or is that just fucked i think it's complicated because yeah i mean i think i was exposed to weird shit because of uh like gateways through popular music you know what i mean so like i don't know i I talk about porn like almost every single time i get interviewed (laughs) it's like i think porn was like a gateway drug to like uh like maybe more like weirder music right yeah or something like that uh, not that they're directly appropriating um i think so long as yeah there is credit 
not to go against like the anti-exposure argument, but like, you know, credit and like platforming, you know, that's, that's very helpful. Like if like a mainstream act, not only just appropriated, but like toured with like a noise act or something like that and promoted it, that would be fucking great. That would be ideal. But I don't, I don't really, that probably doesn't happen that often. Um, but like, what, like, what about if someone just took like a harsh noise track, like took one of your harsh noise tracks mm -hmm. and put it in like a, a soup commercial or like a sunglasses commercial and made oh, it like that. As, I mean, if they're profiting off of it, that sucks past terribly. Um, but the oh, fact yeah, that they're bringing something like this radical and outside uh, into, into the mainstream, does that have any, does that have any, like not for you specifically, but does it have any, any positive? Probably, probably it's changing. If it's changing the culture and like the taste, probably it's good. It's not the best way, but it's good. I, you know, I'm thinking about that Quiznos commercial, you know, the one where uh, there's these, uh, these like horrible like flash animations of these like gremlins singing i don't know it no oh, God. okay um so maybe some people will know what i'm talking about but uh i think humor is like a really good way to expose people to stuff too and then like after humor comes like the sincere engagement with the, the stuff um so eric andre i feel like if he's appropriating noise stuff i think he's changing culture for the better you right. know yeah um, but I'm not a cultural theorist, so I don't, I, I can't say whether there's net good in it. I just think it's complicated. Yeah. yeah. There's different case scenarios. It seems like memes like are getting, you know, they're getting more bizarre and esoteric and simultaneously more like mainstream. But mm -hmm. uh, I see like elements of noise coming into a lot of memes, and internet culture and kind of coming around at least kind of like you know, Merspow is kind of like a household name to some, to like a fair amount of kids on the internet, even if they don't really know what it is and don't like it, you know, like I still, I'm still not sure if that even matters or if that's good or like just, yeah. you know. Yeah. Like ironic enjoyment. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure, but. I think, yeah, exactly. I'm not sure either, but uh, it's like that Benamine thing. It's like, oh, maybe it's an ironic audience that's enjoying the work, but they're still enjoying it. So maybe it's right. Good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, in you, you've you've talked, you've touched on your identity and how that it plays a probably a role in how people receive this aggressive, noisy music, which is also a, you know coming from a scene, a genre that is very, very male dominated. Mm -hmm. In what way have you? Do you think? Or what, what, in what way do you think women have different experiences in experimental music, underground music, noise culture? I know those are kind of three different things, but what are some of the things that you think are fundamentally different in what you experience or go through, positive or negative? Positive or negative. Yeah, yeah, there's some, uh, like, uh, I think, uh, tokenism is a thing that's both positive and negative, right? So it's like, yeah, I mean, you, a lot of responsible bookers want to have a more balanced, diverse kind of um, like lineup when they're booking shows. So that's actually, I mean, it's kind of nice. Um, it also, yeah, but then at, by the same measure, you also seem like, oh, okay, I'm being booked because like I'm a woman or something. So that's, that's one kind of... Um, like bittersweet aspect to it um i think i'm given there's definitely some advantages i'm given a lot more uh leeway to be kind of like invasive of space you know can be maybe like my identity is a little bit more disarming you know um and so it's like if i'm kind of like headbutting so <laughs> not that i headbutt i'm not that bad or uh confrontational but if I do it versus like, you know, a guy doing it, it has a completely different kind of reaction uh, that will, that will happen. It's like, I'm not going to get dogpiled on or something like that. Sure. And so in a way I'm like using my identity in this sort of uh, like, like poking the bear thing, like kind of pushing the, the envelope, seeing what I can get away with. Um, so that's kind of nice. Uh, the a disadvantage is like, I don't know, would I feel like safe? touring alone in like Indonesia or something like that or probably Indonesia is fine but we're I don't know like 
different countries like would i feel okay going to russia by myself probably not you know especially now of course of course now but like you know eastern europe i think would be kind of like strange also being asian might be kind of weird to go over there too so i mean there's things like that that are very practical but um yeah i i think it's good if you're like a woman performer because you're almost guaranteed a platform. There is a lot of places that still like needs to like up their game in terms of like representation of like different uh, like, you know, genders and, and like races in their, in their booking. But by and large, I think it's like, it's a smaller pool, right? So I guess you get more, more platform time or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess that's it. Oh, like, and I guess in dealing with sound dudes sometimes is like an, an issue where they feel like they're the expert and like they're uh there's a lot of their own ego going into like the sound mixing yeah that's annoying when that does happen um which is i mean it's not it's the exception to the rule but it does happen you know um i guess that's it it's not <laughs> sorry it's not like uh i don't have like a super deep answer for it. that's but, okay like, just, like speaking yeah that's okay are you do you, do you find yourself like owning like sound guys or kind of bros who want to like tell you about technical stuff sometimes because you're obviously like a technical uh wizard and you know you know a ton of shit i mean do you find sometimes just being like oh you know what uh i built this and you know i know you know like yeah it's like yeah i know what the point of a di <laughs> is you know it's like this is why it's important to have one in line you know yeah uh, um sometimes i don't like to like my approach i think it's like more Honey is a lot better than than vinegar in terms of getting people to like on your side. Uh, I never want to like browbeat anyone unless they're like an outright asshole. But uh, that I don't think I've ever had like a fucking total asshole. Uh, my favorite is like if somebody mixes my sound like really shitty during the set, even after like going back to the soundboard and being like, "Hey, like do this." uh is like congratulating them and like hugging them and like you kind of like feel guilty for being an asshole <laughs> oh you're so great you're the fucking best oh i need to take you on tour with me like this type of thing and you know <laughs> uh so this is sort of like oblique ways of like getting back at them i think are better yeah <laughs> like, oh you're a dick <laughs> yeah, yeah um wh what do you think or why do you think there are quite a limited amount of females in noise music what do you think is behind that uh, well okay i think a lot of noise historically is like very aggressive and computational and like it, you know violent whether it's like self-violence or like violence directed toward the audience and i think uh women when like they're raised in general are not that's not an allowable permissible kind of expression of like feeling right uh i think that's one major um kind of barrier for for a lot of women to enter it and it's also kind of you know when you just like see all guys doing it it's like a self repeat it it's like a self-perpetuating kind of thing it's like oh why would i do that when i don't like to see other women doing it mm -hmm. thing. Um, i think that's probably it because there's tons of women who are doing it now like a right. lot more i feel like most noise shows that i go to it's like half women performing which is great. Sometimes all women, which is fucking fantastic. Yeah. Um, so I think it's changed a lot in like the last, I don't know, 10 years or something like that. But yeah, before I would say there's, it's, I would see a lot of women at the, the concerts, just fewer performing them. I think, yeah, yeah like Jessica Brown is fucking so, it was so important. I think I'm so spoiled that my introduction into this whole world was through Jessica Rowling because like she was like the mama figure, right? And so it's like, oh, this person is a proponent of it she's very competent i feel like jessica <laughs> sort of was like a great kind of mother figure for me because it's like oh yeah like women can fucking do whatever they want you know women can be confident too uh and so maybe like my barometer for like gender relations and noise is off because like of jessica was like my first introduction um so uh yeah sorry what was your question again did that answer it I think so. I think my question was, uh, why, why there are less, fewer, fewer, fewer women in noise? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, I, I guess I covered that already. I think it's just kind of not the natural confrontational nature of it. Yeah. It's like sort of, uh, the ruffling of feathers. It's not something that's really, uh, encouraged 
with women kind. I even still I have this like people pleasing aspect where it's like, sure. oh, I'm not gonna do it. I'll try and like make you feel weird about it in some other way. Yeah. What would you tell um a uh, a young woman who is discovering noise, is interested in noise, interested in starting to make it? What would you tell them to how to go about it? What you know? Yeah, um, I would say just build stuff from kits. You know, uh, if that's like, if they're interested in making or if they're interested in just performing, just, uh, I mean, just do it. (laughs) (laughs) Just do it. I mean, if there's an appreciation for it, just like listen to as much stuff as you can. Um, And then, yeah, like go to noise shows, like see what you like, try it out yourself. I mean, the, the wonderful thing is, again back to modernism it's like there's a kind of de-skilling it's like how much skill does it take to like smack pedals right yeah. um yeah and and access wise uh in terms of like being able to like afford to play music like have the gear and stuff like that i think there's also ways around that i think building kits is probably the most jam way of doing that cool um what do you see yourself doing with your work five years from now, what do you see, where do you see your work with eviction going or just not necessarily that project, but through what what you do with sound? I'm thinking, uh, I'm seeing, (laughs) I'm seeing, I'm hoping that uh, I'll be able to do more large scale kind of like sound art um, stuff in my practice. So like, I want to do really like ambitious things. And I think, um, I've been thinking a lot about this, uh, uh, Brontus Purnell, I, on a podcast was talking about how he feels DIY damaged in a way because when he was writing his book uh the work passed through so many different hands so so many eyes that uh it was the most highly produced um like piece that he's ever put out into the world and I feel like in a way like I have an advantage where I am able to like make my stuff and like access it at a very granular level but at the same time maybe it's like constraining my imagination so that my projects are not as ambitious as they could be. Maybe I should be more of like an ideas person. Um, there's this uh, this woman artist, Nikita Gale, fucking amazing sound artist. Uh, she's from Atlanta, but she's based in LA now. Uh, and she was like showing me her piece uh, that she had at, was it, um, La- not LACMA, fuck, uh, LAX Art. And, uh, and, um, it was just like a whole film crew went into making it like choreographers, editors, all this stuff. So like the credits were like a mile long. It's like such an amazing work. It's like, fuck, when can I <laughs> get to this point? So I, I think like I will have to like break out of my kind of like DIY mindset um, to do kind of like larger scale work. It's like, well, I, can I use a crane to like take an I-beam to like play the skeleton of a building or something like that? Yeah, that'd be fucking great. Um, yeah, so like very, maybe like large scale installation stuff. I also am starting to like write for like a string quartet. Uh, so like maybe more like composition stuff. Um, I think to like really like stretch out my practice, uh, also, also performing and, and also more collaborating because the first time I was doing music, I was in like a, a band. It was a uh, drummer and I, uh, Dana Cataldo, who's based in New York. Um, our band is called Trim. Mm-hmm. But since then, because Dana moved a uh, away and then I had to perform alone I was like going on tour alone uh and so that's how that project came out and it's like nice to be like a lean ship right you can just like steer very quickly um but I see more collaborations coming up I'm like um doing this tour with Maria Chavez and Mario Merzai in April as like a turntables duo so that'll be like really really cool I I hope and um yeah so that's what I I, I foresee coming in the horizon cool do you think noise musicians noise artists in general are diy damaged this this interesting term because there's also you know there's like a you know you kind of mentioned this split between academia academia kind of rejects anything that calls itself noise or when that term gets used Mm -hmm. at the same time i think i sort of see that noise artists when they identify as noise artists sometimes don't necessarily have the ambition to do things beyond what is you know kind of accepted in, in noise. Do you think there's something going on there? Let's see. It's really ridiculous because in academia, there's new music, which I mean, 
gets super noisy at a lot of points. So it's like a very silly line to draw. Um, but yeah, I think there's this uh, also this mindset of noise artists, which, you know, uh, is parallel to like a lot of like uh, artist attitudes where it's like, oh, if I'm getting paid, if I'm doing something uh, with institutional backing, then I'm like selling out. And I, I don't feel that way. Fuck, I want to be able to like live comfortably just like doing uh, noise stuff or whatever, like kind of like outre art sort of you know my my craft yeah it's it's very valid and i think it's more valid than a lot of more uh commercially acceptable ways and i think it's like i guess if you think about it like you're trying to change the culture for the better that's a good way of looking at it but it's also just like you know survival thing and you know you want to promote this form of music like for your friends too and like you know your your peers and your colleagues so I don't, I don't think it's a, it's a bad thing, but yeah, of course, <laughs> academia does have this resistance to it. So yeah, if you have to sell yourself as a new music artist, then uh, <laughs> why not? No, why not go that route? Uh, there's no, sh- I don't think there's any shame. In it. Yeah. I think I can understand people's aversion to moving those circles, but I, I do, I would like to see people, who are really true noise artists just taking more bold steps. I mean, of course, money is a part of it. I mean, the thing you're talking about the crane and that's, you know, that's, that's, that requires budget and that budget you have to get it somewhere. And then you have to figure out, you know, who you're dealing with to get the money there. But at the same time, I I would like to, I would love to see more noise artists just kind of break out of that kind of mindset of, Oh, got to keep it, but at the same time, I think institutions should fucking step up and like be, take more risks, you know, when with their curation. There's so many fucking institutions with so much money who are just like circulating it around like the same pool of people who are not doing anything interesting or new. So, yeah, I think they should, you know, extend the branch, you know, kind of like look deeper underground, you know, mm-hmm. and instead of like looking up towards the ivory tower. So. That's just my my sense. Like they shouldn't be scared to step into the basement. Cool. Um, I don't know if you know this or are prepared. Some people are, some people aren't. But I like to ask all my guests at the end what their top five noise releases of all time are. Oh fuck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I like when people okay. aren't prepared. Now by by now everyone's like got their list ready, and I like, but I like it more when people can be kind of caught uh, off guard and just kind of come from their memory. Five there are five noise releases that are like. Okay. favorites or formative or or yeah to you okay so then first one i think is excrete music by violent on Geisha because i discovered that that was maybe the first thing i discovered on youtube <laughs> that was like cool. really hard um and then uh fucking burned mine by wolf pies holy fuck so good so many good memories of making out to that that record was like very romantic, close to my heart. Um, fucking shit. Okay, I mean, like Paul Steeman. You have to, and then uh, I got it. Uh, shit, one is another good one. Um, a rubber O cement, which has like an insanely long name. It's like keloids and, and something like that. Uh-huh. Is like a great. I'd have to find it on the rubber O. Um, uh, what should we call it? Uh, band cam. Uh, and then Sad Sad Tits by Mariam Rezai, which is kind of coming from a new, new music angle, but it's fucking noise. So, cool. so yeah, Mariam Rezai, and it just came out this year, Sad Tits with Z's okay. at the end. Yeah. Cool. Super good. Awesome. awesome. Um, I also then like to ask people their top five of the last year or so releases, but I would like to ask you a question, which I hope you don't find tokenizing, but I would like, I think it's an important question is that, can you name five female noise artists? Female are, noise artists, okay. Female or noise artists that are active right now that you think people should be paying attention to. Okay, Layla Bordrill, which I, I'm sorry, Layla, if I'm mispronouncing your name, Charmaine, Charmaine Lee, uh, female noise artists that I really oh dude Andrea Pensado fucking goat total goat the best ever um 
Oh my God. There are, okay. Literally there are so many to choose from. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I mean, you can go, you can go past five. You can, you can. Okay. Yeah. Uh, God, okay. <laughs> Mit Mite from uh, San Francisco. She's Say it again. Local. Mit, Mit Mite. Uh-huh. Uh, okay. And then uh, Kanako Nishi is great. She does like uh, Koto stuff super out there like i said mariam rezai uh so maria chavez is fucking great though yes it's it's not just harsh noise right so sure sure um, uh, let's see who else do i really love uh, uh J- jillian oh jill um forced into femininity <laughs> she's so fucking awesome uh let's see uh can I just stop it at eight? Because I feel like this is going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, great. Thank you. That's awesome. That's a, yeah, that's a gold mine of, of knowledge. And it's good to, it's a good thing to address, I think, directly. Because mm-hmm. there's limited scopes. And I like, I hope my audience can. Oh, Bana Hoffer. No, she's not. She's kind of ambient noise. Okay. She's fucking awesome. Do you know her, Bana? I don't think so. She's uh, like modular. Okay. Uh, out of North Carolina. Anyway, cool. but she's uh, actually, I think, Lebanese. Okay. And she founded, she co founded the Synth Library of Beirut. Really, wow. really amazing. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Very cool. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you um, taking the time to talk to me about all this stuff. Um, we could talk, I'm sure, a lot more, but I will let you off the hook for now. Mm-hmm. Um, and um was there anything else you'd like to add i mean the hairbirth lp is that still available there's a that, that's your yeah that's there your was record? a repress so yeah. yeah it's definitely still available mm-hmm. okay they can also buy it digitally on Bandcamp or order the lp in physical form very cool lp great lp um any, any 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 uh recordings coming up uh eviction Studio oh recordings God. that are going to see live. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think that's a that problem. Yeah, I've been like so focused on live performances. I haven't really like sat down and make arrangements, but there's a bunch of releases that are slated to come out. Um, I did a residency with Billoway uh, this last summer, and so yeah. we're going to put out a split. I built an um, like a kind of a mellotron for him. Uh, mm. and then. Uh, something out on touch records is coming out on tape. Uh, okay. and then I have to do a solo thing and I have to figure out who's going to release it. So, okay. Excellent. All right. Well, anything else you'd like to tell the, the people out there before we sign off? Uh, thanks for listening to me ramble. I, I was telling Oscar earlier, but I'm a little hungover. So please, uh, if you've reached this far, I apologize for rambling. <laughs> There's nothing to apologize for. And everyone has reached this far. I'm sure this has been a good one. So I, Thank you very much and uh, take care and we'll keep in touch. Okay. Sounds good. See you around Oscar. Bye. Thanks. thanks. For Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to white Sandy noise podcast and a big thank you to all the Patreon supporters that make this show possible. If you're a fan of the podcast, but not currently supporting head over to patreon.com slash white noise now to check out the many benefits of doing so and find a level that fits you.